I'm telling you, it's not even by our good works. It's not by how clever we are. It's by our submission to what he says. That's what makes you an overcomer. Praise God, folks. The title of my message this morning is Cherubim. Cherubim is a type of an angel. I want to say to you right at the start, it's not a chubby child with wings, okay? That's a cherub. That's a, a human invention. These are not the same things. A cherubim is an angel of God, and a cherub is a drawing by an artist. In Middle Eastern art, a cherubim is depicted as a lion or as a bull with eagle-like wings and a human face. That I think they get from the book of Ezekiel. But it's, uh, it's a beautiful picture of a cherubim. It's not these cherubs that people have in their garden, okay? Don't think if you put a little cherub in your garden, now you're so uh, anointed and appointed. That's a different thing altogether. So cherubim is first mentioned in Genesis 3.24. And uh, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I would have loved to have seen that sword, a sword that's turning every way. Um, what does that look like? I don't know. I need an artist to try and depict that for me. If you artistic, please draw it and send it to me. I'd love to see this flaming sword. But here you have two of God's angels. And I tell you, these weren't little cherubs. These weren't angels to be messed with. Um, I want you to get something out of the sermon today that they are angels and that they're doing the work of the Lord and they're protecting you and they're not little chubby checkers. Okay? They're real as, what I, as you can see me standing here this morning, these angels are real and they're powerful. They are supernatural beings. Genesis 2.9 And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. So, uh, I read you that scripture so that you can understand that there's a tree of life and there was a tree of death. These two trees, uh, choose life or choose death. And God says, choose life today. Choose the tree of life. Don't choose the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Where else do we come across cherubim in the Old Testament? Because remember, in the Bible, everything is connected. From the old to the new, from the new to the old, it's all connected. So you have to look for the connections. Because it's a blessing when you find them. And the most important thing to know about the Old Testament and the New is that both of them point exactly to Jesus. Don't think that the Old Testament is the Old Testament and the New is the New and it's all about Jesus. No, Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. So we find uh, another reference um, to cherubim in Exodus 25 verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. So now these are artistic depictions. <coughs> they're not real angels, they're made of gold. Uh, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat uh, shalt ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another towards the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be, and there will I meet with thee. What a wonderful scripture. At that place, God said he's going to meet with them. So the word 
the Ten Commandments, which is a, a, perhaps the most important sample of the Word, of the Old Testament, is in this ark that has these two cherubims on it. So the, the Word is in the ark, is also the tree of life. You need to see the connection. There was two cherubim guarding the garden to stop the people from getting to the tree of life. And here, when they make this uh, ark, there's two cherubim on it, and we see that they are, in a sense, guarding over it. Okay. So if the tree of life is the word... And John tells us in John 1.14, uh, the Word became flesh, the same tree of life. Or John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you can see the Word is the tree, is God, is God, is the Word. So it's very clearly spelt out in John 1.1. 1, 1. Do we find cherubim in the New Testament? Hebrews 9 verse 5. Uh, it's especially in verse 5, but I want to start reading at verse 1. <clears throat> then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, <coughs> which had the golden censer and the ark of covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant. <coughs> and over it the cherubim. So here we're reading in the New Testament and we read about cherubim again. Of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. That's so interesting. He's saying there's something so deep here, I don't want to get into it, but just know uh, about these cherubim on this mercy seat. But this morning we're going to get into it a bit. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. Take note of that, folks. Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Continuing with Hebrews 9 verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. And then, folks, it comes the redemption through the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9.11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So if it's a tabernacle not made of hands, where is it? It's in heaven. So everything that was in the tabernacle on earth is in the tabernacle in heaven. But the tabernacle on earth is where they brought the blood of bulls and of goats. But the tabernacle in heaven never saw any blood from any bull and goat. The only blood that was put in that tabernacle as an eternal sacrifice is the blood of Jesus. And folks, the reason that they wanted to crucify Jesus was not that he claimed to be the Son of God. Go and read it in the New Testament. But that he claimed to be the Son of Man. That was his claim. He said, I'm the Son of Man. Which those Jewish people who knew their Bible, their Torah, they understood 
that to be a reference to Genesis 3.15. And so what Jesus was claiming is that the promise that was made uh, in the Garden of Eden to Eve is uh, Jesus was claiming to be the fulfillment of that. And it reads like this, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, so Jesus tramped with his heel on the very head of the serpent, and it bruised the head of the serpent. Satan has forever been damaged. He's bruised, okay? He's, <clears throat> he's not um, uh, at his best. He's been badly hurt. He's been wounded. But he, at the same time, he wounded the heel of Jesus. Jesus had to die on the cross. <clears throat> and that, folks, uh, that Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy in the Torah of Jesus. It was pointing to the Son of Man, or the Son of Woman, if you want to call it that. The child that would come from Eve, that would uh, bruise the head of the serpent, and his name is Jesus. Folks, if you go to the story of Adam, the ground was cursed because of their eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. And so the curse was, you will work this land by the sweat of your brow. But with Cain, whether he sweat on the ground or not, it will not produce anything. I want to tell you the curse is getting worse those years it was getting worse. It's even worse in the earth today. There are many people that are working very hard, sweating day and night to try and make a living, but they live in abject poverty. People in the earth today starving to death as we speak. The curse that is in the earth. I want to tell you that God knew where Adam was. But he asked Adam, where are you? Adam, Eve, where are you? God knew where Abel was. But he asked Cain, where is your brother? As if he didn't know. God knows everything. But the, he asked them with a reason and purpose. And exactly the same today, folks. What did they do? Adam blamed, blamed Eve. Okay, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Can't he look after himself, in other words? Really lying to the face of God like that, uh, when God knew the whole time exactly where he is. And today, folks wonder why they have the curse of Cain over their life. Nothing wants to work. They, they think they good Christians, they think they're doing right. I, I want to tell you, who, who likes figs? Figs is one of my favorite fruits. You can bring the best pot of figs to God that you can buy or that your tree can produce. I, I want to tell you, you don't get to choose. That was the son of Cain. He, he wasn't such a bad guy. He brought an offering to God after all. He was a cack brew. Okay? He was in the church. He wasn't one of those guys that, I reject God, I rebel against God. No, no. I was a cack brew in the church. But he decided how he would serve God. He didn't hear from God that an offering has to contain blood. And folks, don't we do much the same today? We serve God how we think is appropriate. Did it work for Cain is the question I want to ask you. I, I want us to search our own hearts. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning. How, how you serve God. You might think, 
you, you're doing so well. But God is not impressed unless we do it His way. I, I can tell you, if you understand we down here and God is way up there, big, powerful. Yes, He comes and He dwells in our heart. That's just because of His goodness and His kindness. He's much bigger than us. It's like when I went to the army and they introduced me to my lieutenant. He's got two pups over here. He was at school with me, at Fishhook School. He was a, a, a year or so ahead of me and um, he was the head boy and I didn't take any nonsense from him at school. No nonsense. Don't think because you're the head boy you're going to push me around. Okay, you're not a teacher, you're not the principal, just know your authority, okay? Behave yourself. And then I came to the army, and yeah, they introduced me to my lieutenant. Uh, uh, ah, Nick, it's nice to meet you here. Are you going to die today, my boy? Yeah, he got me. I tell you, I was here at Youngsfield. I ran up and down sand dunes and uh, you, you have to run up the sand dune and down the sand dune. When you get to the bottom, you have to drink a few liters of water. Then you have to run up again uh, and they're not going to finish with you until everybody's vomited and everybody's rolled in that vomit uh, and they get you super fit. Okay? But I had to understand that this is not my buddy anymore. Uh, so then we did uh, rock PT. Everybody find a heavy rock and get on your back and the rock is up in the air and it's down on your chest. Uh, I thought, this lieutenant guy, I found me a little stone like this. Man. <laughs> the, the next minute, I just saw this big rock coming from heaven. He took this rock and he threw it on my chest. He said, that's your size, my boy. Uh, and I had to lift this rock. I could hardly pick it up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, and then we went uh, to the border to Angola. And uh, I had a captain there who I, I think he thought he was like special forces. He would disappear into the bush for days and we'd never see him. But he was always around there somewhere. All by himself. You know, when we went out, we were 10 or 20 guys to look out for each other and uh, not this captain. He was all on his own. And they had a lovely river that flows through Angola into Namibia. Uh, we, uh, it was, it's called the Canini River, but we renamed it Rio Canini because it was beautiful. And of course, when you're in a foreign country, you don't have a shower every day and, and whatnot. So we would swim in the Rio Canini, which was completely out of bounds because you're in a foreign country. If the enemy arrives and you're all, in, you're all together swimming and there's a whole lot of crocodiles in the river as well, it's big trouble. So we had more guards watching for the crocodiles than watching for the enemy. And our captain had a knack of when we were all naked in the water of coming out of the bush and saying, oh, is this what's going on here? Very nice. Okay. Tomorrow morning, I will see you at this spot on the map. And he'd draw a mark on the map and he'd disappear into the bush again. And that was 50 kilometers away. Uh, and we did that for a whole week's punishment. 50 kilometers every day for swimming in the Rio Canini. <coughs> and so you understand this guy has authority. But, folks, I, I don't want you to get a militaristic idea of God, but I want you to understand that he's big and he's holy and he's not your buddy. He's your best friend, but he's not your buddy. Okay? And you don't do it your way, you do it his way. I couldn't say to the captain, but captain, that's very far, you know. Uh, I don't even know how he got there. Maybe he also walked. Maybe he went by helicopter. We don't know. He disappeared, and then we just see him there again. Maybe sometimes we didn't even see him there, but he knew we were there. He's hiding somewhere in the bush. So, 
Folks, Jesus might not be in your face. You might not see him all the time, but he knows what you're up to. He knows what you're doing. And he catches you at the very moment you don't want to be caught. Because he'll show up. Not because he wants to hurt you. That captain didn't want to hurt us. He was trying to protect us from ourselves. He said, you're a bunch of idiots. If, you, uh, if I can catch you, any terrorist could catch you. You're fast asleep. Nobody even saw me coming. But he was very good, I must confess. He would just appear out of the bushes like he was an angel or something. And I want us to get this message in our heart that God is very big. He's very powerful. And he decides. We don't decide. We don't do church how we want to do church. Um, well, we can and we often do, but it doesn't please God. And it's like bringing an offering like Cain to this holy God. Holy, holy God. We bring him an offering. We church people, we will serve God how we think is correct. And how our family has taught us. And It's not good enough, folks. God says there's a way that is right and there's a way that's wrong. And you do it my way and finished. And we wonder why we have the curse of Cain upon our life so often. Where everything goes wrong, nothing works, there's always trouble. You don't feel like Jesus is coming through for you. Maybe we've got to stop questioning God and start questioning ourselves. Are we doing things the way we instructed to do things in the Word. The Word is the final authority on these things. Not me, not you, the Word. The Word gives the final authority. So this tree of life was guarded by mighty warrior angels until Jesus shed His blood. And you know, they've made movies about the lost ark and trying to find the ark. They can't find it. They'll never find it. Because the ark was there with those two angels. I don't know, maybe the angels took it. Um, uh, if you know who's got the ark, let me know. I'd like to see it. Okay? But for hundreds and thousands of years, people have been looking for the ark. They never found it. Because on that ark was two cherubim that were guarding the tree of life. But when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? That curtain opened. I wonder who opened it. Maybe it was the cherubim. They were right there. By the shed blood of Jesus, we have access to the tree of life. No more cherubim guarding the way. But the important thing to know is there is no other way. There's no other way to God. There's no other way to life. There's no other way to blessing than the very tree of life. And his name is Jesus. He's the root. And we can be grafted into that very root. And then the sustenance comes up from the root into our very lives. If you're not grafted into Jesus, you will not experience abundant life, abundant health, abundant prosperity, every good thing that comes from God. Because we're serving God in our own thinking, in our own mind. We think, oh, I think this is acceptable for God. But maybe God sitting on His throne and saying, that's not acceptable, Cain. Thank you for... Can you imagine this gift that Cain brought? The best veggies. And yesterday I made some brinjal and it was jolly delicious, even if I say so myself. I'm sure he must have had some brinjal and some cabbage and some um, cauliflower and, man, all of the best stuff. And just think, what is your favorite fruit? You like grapes, you like mangoes. Maybe he had some of that. 
all very good stuff that he offered to God. And God said, it's not good enough because not my way. It's not following my instruction because I am the head of the church. And I will lay down the law as to exactly how you are to serve me. Revelations 2.7 He that hath an ear I see all of you have brought your ears with you this morning. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him that overcometh. Not to everybody. To him that overcometh. How do we overcome? I'm telling you it's not even by our good works. It's not by how clever we are. It's by our submission to what he says. That's what makes you an overcomer. When we're listening to his voice, when we're doing what he tells us to do, then we become overcomers. Revelations 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have rights to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The tree of life and enter in gates into the city. I have a feeling, I didn't read this in the Bible, I just have a feeling that at the wedding feast of the Lamb, there will be angels at the door. Uh, I have actually read something like that in the New Testament, but I didn't read that it was specifically cherubim. But I have a feeling it's going to be mighty cherubim at the door to the wedding feast. And not everybody gets to come in. Only those that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and have put on the righteousness of Christ. It's a garment that you put on. It's not about how goody two-shoes you are. It's about did you put on Christ. And they overcame him. Who did they overcome? The accuser, the snake, the liar, the one that has been wounded, the one whose head has been damaged. He's had a knock to the head by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Can I ask you to stand with me and bow your heads and close your eyes?